So just it's always important when you start preparing for your examinations that you use the examination guidelines and your teacher should have it available for you or you can access it online. And in the examination guidelines, it tells you what topic is in each paper, but also it tells you the weighting of each topic, which is very important when you are preparing. So if we start off with paper one, you can see that there are quite a few topics. And if you look, the highest weighting goes to responding to the environment, and that's with regards to humans. So that's looking at the brain, the nervous system, um, looking at the eye, the ear, all of that would be underneath term um, would be underneath that section, and that's fifty four marks in your one hundred and fifty mark paper. So weigh in about a third of your paper, and then the next one would be human reproduction, which also has a high weight and being forty one marks out of one hundred and fifty. So also close to being a third of your paper. And then the other topics are reproduction in vertebrates, um, responding to the environment in plants, and then lastly, endocrine and homeostasis. So a lot of topics, it is important that you do prepare um, in advance because there are a lot of topics for paper one. And if we look at paper two, paper two consists of DNA, meiosis, genetics and inheritance and evolution. And again, the highest weightings will go to evolution, which counts 54 marks out of 150, which is again almost the, is a third of the paper. And then genetics and inheritance, 48 marks out of 150. So also about a third of your paper. So you can see that they have a high weighting for paper two. So just with regards to the format of the examination papers, which I'm sure you are familiar with, because they should have been um, the format followed since you've started life sciences, you'll always start with section A, which will have your short questions. It always starts off with multiple choice, then it goes to your terminologies, then the A, B, both or none, and then short answers, and that's for 50 marks. And then you have section B, which has your variety of questions. So shorter to longer type of questions. And they would have two or four questions and they would equal 100 in total section B. There are no essay questions. It's just shorter to longer type of questions. So that would be the format for your examination papers that you can expect for your final examinations in November. Then just instructions. So they always give you instructions on the question paper and it's important to go through them. And I'm just going to briefly touch on ones that you must pay attention to. So firstly, answer all the questions. I always encourage students to never leave a question out. Try your best to um, put an answer down. Even if you're not sure, just put something down that's relevant because you never know. You may get a mark and maybe right. Then always number your answers correctly. Often we find um, students misnumber. So follow that question paper. Make sure you read in the question and have the correct question number down for your answer. Then pre present your answers correctly according to the instructions of each question. And this is important. So if they're asking for describe, please don't do a flow diagram or don't do a table. They're asking for a description. So that would require your sentences and typically a short paragraph. If they say tabulate, then you know you need to draw a table and you get one mark for putting it in a table. So it's very important to look at what they want from you and how to present your, um, your answers. Then no graph paper is provided and always come prepared to exam in that you must have a calculator, protractor and compass because they may ask you to draw a pie chart. So you'll need those drawing tools for it as well as a ruler. And that you would not realize by now that there is always a calculation question in the papers. And you'll see now we all have calculation questions. So please make sure that you bring those drawing tools to each of your exams. And lastly, write neatly and legibly. So just um, exam tips. I'm going to quickly go through this because we'll 
cover it now when we go through the different questions. But when it comes to multiple choice questions, it is extremely important that you do not write A slash B, that you only write one answer. Because let's say A is correct, which it isn't in this scenario, but if it is, and you write A slash B, they go to still mark it wrong because you're given two answers and they only ask for one answer. So this will always be incorrect. Instead, you only give the one letter down. So in this case, um, regulating the salt content would be D. So please be careful with that and make sure you're not writing more than one answer down. And sorry, before I go on, please also don't write D adrenal gland because you didn't follow the instructions, so it won't be marked correctly. Then the terminology section, which I know it's not always the most liked section where they give you the definition and you have to give the term. Please try your best to spell as accurately as possible. Um, especially when it comes to words like glucagon and glycogen, which are so similar with just a few letters different that spelling does matter for those. So try your best to um, spell correctly. And then the column ones. It's important when they give you a column question and they say you need to then select whether it applies to A only, B only, A and B or none, that you follow that instruction correctly. So for example, the first one, plant defense mechanism, and you need to select if that's thorns, chemicals, both or none, your answer would need to be written as A only or B only or A and B or none. And in this case, it would be both A and B. So please read that instruction carefully. And then again, just often we see these um, little things popping up when we mark metric papers is that when they ask for give the letter, um, then sometimes the students just write the name of the part and not necessarily the letter. Or sometimes they ask for the letter and name, then um, the students only write the letter. So again, it just goes down to making sure that you read exactly what is being asked. I usually highlight or underline keywords so I can make sure that um, I'm answering what is being asked. Okay, so we're going to start off with paper one and we'll start off with section A. So I'm going to give you five minutes to answer section A by yourself. Okay, let's go through the multiple choice questions. So firstly, remember to always read the instructions. So this one says very options are given as possible answers to the following questions. Choose the answer and write only the letter A to do next to the question numbers in your answer book. So we start off with 1.1.1. It says which part of the brain controls the heart rate? So in this scenario, I would highlight heart rate because that's the key word. And then I would go through the various options. So starting off with the hypothalamus. We know that the hypothalamus is your thirst center, your hunger center, your sleep center. So in this scenario, it doesn't control heart rate. Then the cerebrum. We know that the cerebrum um, controls voluntary actions, it's with intelligence, emotions, memory, or arm. Um, so it's not going to be the cerebrum. And then the next one, the cerebellum. The cerebellum, we know, coordinates voluntary movements, but is also there for balance and posture. So again, it won't be that. So that leaves us with the medulla oblongata. And we know the medulla oblongata controls your heart rate and your breathing rate. So in this scenario, in this question, the answer for 1.1.1 is D. Going on to 1.1.2, which one of the following hormones prepares the body for an emergency? So now if we go down the list, ADH, antidiuretic hormone, that prepares the body, or it's not preparing, it's controlling the water volume in our blood. 
so it won't be ADH. Testosterone, we know, um, stimulates puberty and sperm production, so it won't be that. Adrenaline, that can be an option because it does prepare the body for an emergency. So we can put a tick there. And then if we look at TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, we know that will stimulate your thyroid gland to secrete thyroxin. So that's no. So in this scenario, I would have highlighted um, prepares body for emergency and the answer would be adrenaline. So it will be C. 1.1.3, which one of the following refers to the process whereby sperm and ova are produced in the testes and ovaries? So they're asking for process where sperm and ova are produced. So if we go down our list again, we can then see that gametogenesis, we know is a process of producing your gametes, which would be sperm and ova. So that would be correct. If I look at the other options, eugenesis, that is only producing ova. And spermatogenesis is only producing sperm. And the question was asking the process where sperm and ova are produced. And then ovulation is just when um, the ova is released from the ovary. So the answer for 1.1.3 would be A. The next one, the central nervous system is made up of the... Now remember the central nervous system runs centrally down your body. So that's a nice way to remember it. So I would highlight central nervous system. And then I would go through the list that they've given me. So is the central nervous system made up of cranial and spinal nerves? No, that's what the peripheral nervous system is made up of. Is it made up of the atomic and peripheral nervous systems? No. Is it made up of cranial nerves and the brain? No. And is it made up of the brain and the spinal cord? Yes. So often they ask either what the central nervous system is made up of, which is the brain or the sp and the spinal cord, or they ask what is the peripheral nervous system made up of, and then it's the cranial and spinal nerves. So just be careful when you read that question. And like I did, I would highlight they are central nervous system. Okay, then we've got the next question. So questions 1.1.5 and 1.1.6 are based on the diagram of the human male reproductive system. So when I get questions like this, I always suggest that start off by filling in labels that you know. So for example, one would be the prostate gland. This is going to help you answer the questions. Two would be your cowper's gland. Three would be your epididymis. And four would be your scrotum. So we've got those labels. Now we go to the question. So it says, which numbered part is responsible to keep the temperature a few degrees lower than body temperature? So if we're working with regards to temperature and which number here, that would be the scrotum, which is number four. So your answer for 1.1.5 will be D. Just give it a little tick over there. And in the next one, 1.1.6, which numbered part or parts contribute contributes to the development of mature and motile sperm? So that is important to highlight, that it's the mature and motile sperm. So if we start off with the first one, which is mature sperm, where does sperm mature? Well, that would be the epididymis, which is number three. So I'm just going to underline it so we know the difference between them. And then the next one says motile sperm. So motile sperm would mean that it's supplying fluid for the sperm to swim in. So here we will look at the labels. We know the scrotum doesn't. Does the culpus gland supply fluid? Yes. And does the prostate gland supply fluid? Yes. So that would mean that the answer will consist of number one, two, and three. So here, your answer would be B.
one, two, and three. If you have any questions or you want me to explain something, please do put it in the chat and then Yana can just let me know and I can explain it to you. Okay, then we go on to 1.1.7. During an investigation, a man was placed in an airtight room. So that's important information. Sensors were used to monitor, monitor his breathing and heart rate. The investigators were able to change the environmental conditions in the room. After 30 minutes, the man's breathing and heart rate increased. The investigators changed the environmental conditions in the room by. So if it's related to breathing and heart rate and saying that his heart rate increased, you would need to think, well, what is causing an increase in heart rate and breathing? So we now go through the list. Is it a decrease in humidity? No. Is it a decrease in the light intensity? No. Is it increase in the amount of carbon dioxide? That could be because if there's more carbon dioxide in the room, that will mean that I want to get rid of carbon dioxide faster so my breathing and heart rate would increase. And then I just always check all my options to make sure that I am correct when I go through multiple choice. Increase in the amount of oxygen, that wouldn't be correct. So the answer would be C. Okay, then we go on to 1.1.8. The diagram represents the part of the eye responsible for accommodation. So again, I would highlight that we're looking at the process of accommodation. Now, you must know that accommodation occurs when we view objects closer than six meters. So ultimately, I want my lens to become more convex. So I want it to bulge out more. So now let's look at the steps to describe accommodation in the eye. So if we start off, we know that the structure, so we've got the ciliary body or the ciliary muscle, then we have the suspensory ligaments, and that would be attached to the lens over here. So in this case, will the ciliary muscles contract? Yes, it will. So we know that it's option um, so it's the first one. Sorry, let me do text it's easier. Then the suspensory ligaments become taut. That doesn't happen. When I want it to bulge out more, then the suspensory ligaments slacken. So that won't be correct. Then the tension on the lens increases. That won't be correct because then it will become less biconvex. Then the lens becomes more convex. Yes, remember, I want it to bulge out more. I want it to become more biconvex. And when it becomes more biconvex, when it bulges out more, then there would be a higher refractive power. So we know that it would be then number five as well. So that's how I would go through it. And that would leave me with the answer of C for 1.1.8. Then we go to 1.1.9, which one of the following hormones controls metabolic rate? So again, I would highlight metabolic rate. And if we quickly go through the list, testosterone, we know doesn't control that. That's puberty and um, production of sperm. Glucagon, we know controls your sugar levels in your blood. Thyroxin, yes, it controls your metabolic rate. And if we just look at estrogen, estrogen would be your female hormone, which will be controlled in puberty. Okay, so your answer for 1.1.9 would be C. And then lastly, 1.1.10, when there is a decrease in body temperature, which one of the following shows a correct response by blood capillaries in the skin? So if there's a decrease in the human body temperature, the ultimate goal would be that I want to conserve heat. I don't want to lose heat through my skin. I want to retain the heat. So what would be the response? Well, firstly, my, I would have constriction of blood capillaries. 
Why? Because if I had dilation, more blood would flow to the skin and I would lose more heat. But if I have constriction of blood capillaries, less blood flows to the skin, more blood will flow towards my internal body and my internal organs, and that would then decrease the blood flow to the skin. And that would then retain the heat. So that would leave me with my answer as number four. So in this case, it is D. Are there any questions on multiple choice, Yona? Not at the moment. I saw that Kindle High School, they answered up until 1.1.5 in the chat for you. Okay, great. Well, hopefully so they were working very hard. <laughs> okay, but that's perfect. Thank you for working through it and please keep putting um, your answers in the chat. Um, it does, it's nice that you are interacting. So hopefully that you've all got the answers for the multiple choice questions. We're now going to move to the terminology. So 1.2, I'm going to give you three minutes to complete the terminology. And again, you can pop the answers in the chat. Okay, we can start with terminology. Are there any answers that came up in the chat? Yes, I see that Sinanjongu has posted all of the, the terminology for you, 1.2.1.2.1.9. Oh, great. Okay, well, so we start with 1.2.1. .1. So the strategy by the parents, so that's important, where food and protection are provided to increase survival of the offspring. Do we have an answer for that one? Yes. So the answer we have in the chat is altricial development. Okay. So for this question, it's asking for the strategy by parents where food and protection are provided. So in this case, it's going to be parental care. So because they are given food and protection, it's not saying when they gave food and protection before basically birth or after birth. It's more talking about how involved the parents are. For this one, it will be parental care. If we go on to the next one, it says the secretions that are produced in small quantities by the endocrine glands. So what is being produced or sorry, what has been secreted by the endocrine glands? Do we have an answer for that one? 
Yes, yeah, so the answer we have for that is hormones. Hormones is correct. So hormones will be the answer for question 1.2.2. Then we move on. The fluid surrounding the developing fetus in the uterus. So the fluid, do we have an answer? Amniotic fluid. Amniotic fluid is correct. Then 1.2.4, the plant hormone responsible for the germination of seeds. Do we have an answer? We do, German relins. That is correct. Just want to get my spelling correct as well. So the way I remember um, the different plant hormones, just for those that... um. One a little tip. So when it has germination, the way I remember it, G for germination, G for gibberellins. So that's how I remember which plant hormone um, belongs to that one. Okay, we go on to the next one. A structure in the head of a sperm containing enzymes. So that's important, containing enzymes. Do we have an answer? Yes, so we have two answers that came through and they both say acrosome. Acrosome is correct. And remember the acrosome, the enzymes are there to penetrate the ovum to allow the nucleus to enter for fertilization. Then the functional gap at which a nerve impulse passes from one neuron to another. Do we have an answer? So the answer we have there, again, from two different um, respondents, and they both said a synapse. Synapse is correct. Then the liquid secreted by the testes and associated glands. So liquid secreted by testes and the glands. So what would be the name for that liquid? Do we have an answer? But yes, we do, ma'am. One of the things I think I can look at one of the answers here, and this is perhaps touching on what you said when you did the multiple choice as well. There's an answer here that says semen slash alkaline. Mm. Okay, so when it comes to terminology, when in most cases, in with throughout your exam, please only refer to just writing down one answer only. And for this one, they're asking for the liquid produced by the testes, which would then be the sperm, plus the glands will be the seminal fluid. So the name for both of those, the testes and the seminal fluid, would be semen. So always try and write down one answer only because they may not mark it correct, even though you did semen slash alkaline fluid. So please stick to one answer only. Then 1.2.8, the shredding of the endometrium and an unfertilized ovum. So the shredding of the endometrium lining and an unfertilized ovum, what do we have over here? We have menstruation. Menstruation is correct. And then the last one for terminology, the protective membrane covering the cornea of the eye. So this is over the cornea. So what would be an answer for this one? So we've got two different answers here. The first option that was provided by the schools is sclera. And then the second option provided was the conjunctiva. Okay, so the conjunctiva is the correct one. So that is the membrane covering the cornea of the eye. The sclera runs towards the back of the eye and is also offering protection, but towards the back of the eye. What is covering the cornea, so that would be the front of the eye, would be the conjunctiva. So that's just um, the way to remember the two. Okay, that was great. Then we're going to go on to 1.3.1. Um, 1.3. So again, this is the column situation. So again, please read that question and make sure you only write A only, B only, both A and B if it applies to both or write none. It's not only A or B. Remember, there's always that option to have both A and B or none. So I'm going to give you two minutes to quickly do this and then we can discuss it. Okay, let's quickly go through this one. So 1.3.1, secretions are released into a 
cavity or duct of the body. So this is the secretions, mostly hormones, would be released into the duct. So in this scenario, it will be an exocrine gland. So your answer would be B only. An endocrine gland secretes it into the bloodstream directly. It is important that you know the difference between an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland. So endocrine gland secretions are directly into the bloodstream. Exocrine gland secretions are into a cavity or duct. And there's, um, and you must know that the pancreas is an example of an endocrine and exocrine gland. Okay, the next one, the young develop and is nourished in an amniotic egg that is retained in the mother's body. So, in other words, the mother has an amniotic egg inside of her. So, now we look at our options. We know viviparity is where the mother gives live birth. Oviparity is where the mother would lay an egg outside the body. And oviviparity would be where the amniotic egg, there's an egg inside the mother and it hatches inside the mother and then is born live. So in this scenario, it would be none because it's an amniotic egg inside the mother. And then increases the permeability of the renal tubules for osmoregulation. So now we know ADH controls the water level in our blood. So osmoregulation is controlling the water level. And when do we have an increase of permeability? So more water is reabsorbed into the bloodstream. That would be under the influence of more ADH. So your answer is B only. Okay. All right, we're going to now move on to 1.4. So the diagram below shows the female reproductive system. So before I go on to answering any, any questions, I usually try and label what I'm given so it helps me with answering the questions. So if we look at this, we know A would be the fallopian tube. We know B would be ovary. C would be cervix, D would be vagina, and then E would be uterus. It's important that E, you notice that it's pointing to the space and it's not pointing to the muscle on the side, which would then be the endometrium. So um, make sure when you get a question like this that you can differentiate between the two. Okay, now that we've got our labels, we can look at our questions. So the first question says identify part A, and that we've already done. By just labeling the diagram, we can already answer that. And so that would be fallopian tube. And then it says identify part C, and we've done that now by labeling. So that would be the cervix. Then it says, Give the letter only of the part where each of the following takes place. The first one is meiosis. Now remember, meiosis is when they form gametes. And in this scenario, we're working with the female reproductive system. So we have form over. So in what structure, in what letter would meiosis take place? And in this scenario, we know that meiosis would take place in the ovaries. So your answer for that one would be B. So for 1.4.2, the answer is B. Then give the letter only of the part where each of the following takes place, where fertilization takes place. So fertilization is where the ovum and the sperm cell will fuse and the nuclei of each of them will fuse. So where is that happening? And that will be happening in the fallopium tube. And they want the letter. So your answer is A. If you write your answer for that one as fallopium tube, unfortunately, you won't get it correct because they're asking for the letter. That is why it's so important to read the instructions carefully. 
Okay, moving on, 1.4.3 states two functions of part E, and it's for two marks. So that means you need to list two things. So we look at E, we know E is the uterus. So what would be two functions of the uterus? Not the endometrium lining or the endometrium, but of the uterus. So firstly, we can we'll know that it will provide protection for the embryo and for the fetus while it develops over there. So we'll say um, responsible for protection of the embryo. So that will be one thing. Just skip it over there. And then the other thing, because remember they asked for two things, is that it would provide space for the developing fetus. So that's the uterus. So it's providing protection, and then it's also providing space for the developing fetus. And then 1.4.4 says name the glands which secrete nutrient-rich fluid for the sperm to reach A. So we know that there would be three glands in the male reproductive system. So we have the calpis gland, the prostate gland, and we have the seminal vesicles. But now... There's a specific question that they actually ask, and they want to know which gland out of those three are secreting the nutrient-rich fluid. In this case, your answer would be the seminal vesicles. So they provide the nutrient-rich fluid that then would enable it to reach part A. We know the prostate gland is providing an alkaline fluid to neutralize the acidic secretions of the vagina. And we know that the calpis gland is providing mucus for the movement of the sperm. So it is important that you know what those different glands functions are for the sperm. Okay, so but this one, like I said, you've got to read it carefully. It was about nutrients rich fluid. Any questions? No questions at the moment, but I can tell you that all the answers that have come through in the chat have been 100% correct. So your audience is definitely on the ball today. Oh, that's great to hear. Okay, so we're going on to 1.5. So the diagrams below represent different disorders or defects in the human body. And they've given you four different ones. So if I start off with diagram A, I could see it has to do with the eye. And what I am noticing over here is that we've got the focal point that is not reaching the retina and that they have to use a specific type of lens, glass lens, to correct it. Then I look at diagram B, and we've got to do with a thyroid gland and an enlarged thyroid gland. Diagram C, they've got a cochlear implant, and then diagram D, we can see there are many focal points. So where the on the retina. So now we go to the questions. 1.5.1 says, identify the following represented in diagram B, the disorder. So because it's an enlarged thyroid gland, the disorder associated with it would be goiter. And it's important that you know this one. It does pop up often. So that would be the disorder. And then the next question says, um, identify the possible dietary cause of the disorder. So what could possibly cause an enla enlarged thyroid gland? So the answer for that one would be lack of iodine. 
So it is important that you know with the thyroid gland that the a disorder associated with it is goite and the possible cause of it, a dietary one, would then be lack of iodine. Then it says 1.5.2, name the visual defect represented in diagram A. So like I said to you, in diagram A, we have the focal, focal point that is not reaching the retina. It's happening in front of the retina. So that would mean that the person has short-sightedness. because the focal point is before. If it was long-sightedness, the focal point will be after, behind the retina. And you can see here that they are using concave lenses to correct it so that the focal point reaches the retina. So that was the answer for 1.5.2a. Then they say name the visual defect represented in diagram D, so this is where there are many focal points, so this would be astigmatism. It is important that you do know the visual defects. So it's short-sightedness, long-sightedness, astigmatism, and then another one's going to come up later. Um, for all of them and for hearing any defects, you do need to know how to correct it. 1.5.3, give a possible cause of the image falling on more than one focus point in diagram D. So we can even see over here, if I even just look at diagram A and diagram D, that the lens shape, this one has a good lens shape, this one has an irregular lens shape. You can see how it's bulging out a bit on that one side and not so much on the other side. And that's irregular shape lens along with the irregular shape cornea will cause the refraction of the light to hit many focal points. And that would then create a blurry vision, which would then be astigmatism. So your answer for the possible cause of the image falling on more than one focal point would be irregular shaped cornea. And then 1.5.4, name the defect that is treated with a cochlear implant as shown in diagram C. So the defects, that's the key word, with a cochlear implant. So cochlear implants, we know that the cochlea is involved in hearing. So a cochlear implant would then be used if the person has deafness or hearing loss or their hearing is impaired. So deafness or hearing loss or hearing impairment. 1.5.5, name the defect where the lens becomes cloudy and prevents light from reaching the retina. So in this case, that will be where it's all cloudy, light can't pass through, and that would be known as cataract. So that's your fourth visual defect that you do need to know. And then name the defect treated with the insertion of a grommet in the tympanic membrane. So that would be middle ear infection. And that's the grommet's role is to basically equalize the pressure between the inner, um, between the middle ear and the outer ear. Okay, so that brings us to the end of section A, which like we said, were all your short answers. Now we're going to start section B, which will be your slightly longer questions. Is there any questions in the chat before I go on? No questions at the moment, ma'am. Okay, perfect. Let's start with question two. So 2.1 the diagram below represents two human gametes. 
So remember I said before we even look at the questions, we can start to just label. It just helps us to orientate ourselves with the image, with the diagram, and then to answer the questions easier. So if we look at A, so A would be the nucleus. B, we've got the middle piece. And then C would be the jelly layer. It is important that you are able to label both the human gametes, the sperm and the ovum. Okay, so let's start with the questions 2.1.1. What is the function of layer C? So we already said that layer C is a jelly layer, but they are asking for the function of it. So what would be the function of the jelly layer? So your answer for this one would be that it provides protection. Provides protection for the early stages of the fertilized egg. You could say, as an alternative answer, if you want to, that it also helps the movement of the ovum or the embryo through the fallopian tube. So facilitates movement of the ovum through the fallopian tube. As an alternative, you could do either or. But an easy way to remember is the outer layer is going to provide protection. Then the next one says explain. So that's important. So that's a cause and effect. So explain the role that part B plays in increasing the chances of fertilization. So part B we've identified as a middle piece. Now we need to think what is in the middle piece. And how does it increase the chance of fertilization? So we know inside the middle piece, there will be many mitochondria. What does the mitochondria do? It provides energy for locomotion. So to allow the sperm to swim quickly and to hopefully fertilize the ovum. Okay, so if we had to answer it, you're going to get one mark saying it provides energy. To the sperm that will get you a one mark and your other mark well how's that increase in chances of fertilization for locomotion so remember it's an explain question so it's a cause and effect it's providing energy and how is that beneficial well it's allowing it to be able to swim for movement for locomotion okay 2.1.3 Describe the significance of the chromosome number of part A. So we've identified that part A is the nucleus and it's a gamete. So how many chromosomes would a gamete have? A human gamete so it would have 23 chromosomes or it would be haploid. How is that significant? Why is it 23? as opposed to 46. Well, we know that if the... Sorry to interrupt you, Ms. Lewis. No problem. But I can see, so exactly what you said now, maybe again, just something for our learners to remember. One of the answers that came through in the chat mm. um, for 2.1.3 said the answer is 23. So like mm. you said now, 23 is the number, but now you are going to describe the significance yes. of that number. So just yes. for our learners to be mindful of when the, the action verb is described to mm. not just simply state the answer. Yes. No, that's very important to take note of. And often students miss those key things because you, they are correct. You are correct by saying there's 23 chromosomes, but you're not fully answering the question. And that's not going to get you two marks. So yes, one mark is awarded by saying 
that part A is haploid or part A has 23 chromosomes, but how is that significant? And that's where you've got to describe why 23 over 46 chromosomes, essentially. And why? It's because, remember, when the sperm cell fertilizes the ovum, the nuclei of the two fuse, I want it to be 23 and 23 so that I can get a diploid zygote of 46 chromosomes. If A was 46 chromosomes and the ovum nuclei was 46, I would have a doubling of chromosome number. So where the marks are coming for this question, I'm going to show you on the memo so that they, you can understand why it's just not going to get you 23 chromosomes or get you all the marks. So if we look over here, let me just zoom in a bit. So part A is haploid, has 23 chromosomes. So that's what has come up in the chat. That's going to get you one mark. But why is that significant? Why is that important? And there we go to explain. So that after fertilization, the zygote has a diploid number of chromosomes so that there are only 46 chromosomes. Right, so it's preventing the doubling of chromosome um of chromosome numbers after fertilization. So the importance is that the zygote only has 46 chromosomes, and that's what's going to get you your second mark. Okay, then we go on to 2.1.4, use a flow diagram. So now they want you to use a flow diagram to give the correct sequence of the developmental stages of a fertilized ovum until a fetus is formed. So from fertilized ovum until fetus. And again, it's two marks. So it is important that you know these steps and actually to be able to describe the steps. But in this case, they only want a flow diagram. So your answer here would be, it goes from a fertilized ovum. So the next one would be a zygote. After zygote, you know that the zygote divides by mitosis to form a ball of cells, which is a marula. Then the marula will form a hollow ball of cells, and that will be called a blastella or blastocyst, and that would then eventually form a fetus. So the implantation will happen, and then lastly, a fetus will develop. So for this question, it's important that you go from a fertilized ovum until a fetus is formed. And zygote, marula, blastocyst, and then fetus. And it's an all or nothing. So either you're going to get two marks or you're going to get no marks. So make sure that you do know that order of um, from fertilization to implantation. Okay, then we'll go to 2.2. So here they're giving you a little scenario and you need to read it because sometimes the answers are there. All the questions are related to the text. So please don't bypass it. First read it and then go to the questions. So this says the female phone nest tree frog releases a batch of eggs which are then fertilized by sperm from a mating partner as well as other nearby males. Now, firstly, there's a lot of information in that sentence. So the female frog is releasing a batch of eggs. So that means the eggs are being released outside of the body and then they are fertilized by sperm from a mating partner as well as other nearby males. So that's important that the eggs are released outside of her because that's going to tell us the type of fertilization and then we can also see that the sperm is um, fertilizing it. As the eggs are laid, male frogs will cover it with foam. These foam nests are found in water puddles, tree branches or buried underground. The nests prevent dehydration, which is drying out, predation and infection from bacteria and fungi. It also provides a healthy environment for the developing embryos. So 
That's given us information of how the foam nests are beneficial to them. So it prevents dehydration, predation, infection from bacteria and fungi and healthy environments for the developing embryos. Sunlight will harden the nest's outer surface. After a few days, the developing tadpoles break out and fall into the water where they will complete their development. Okay, so let's look at the questions. So 2.2.1 says state the type of fertilization used by the foam nest trees. So they want type of fertilization. So here, remember, it's either going to be internal fertilization or external fertilization. And the difference between the two, internal fertilization happens inside the female's body. External fertilization happens outside the female's body. And like I said, this first sentence is telling us that answer. The female foam nest tree frog releases a batch of eggs, which are then fertilized by sperm. So that's then happening outside the female's body. So your answer for 2.2.1 uh, would be external fertilization. Then the next one says, state two ways in which the chances of fertilization in these frogs are increased. So how is fertilization increased in these frogs? So if we go back, your answers are going to be again in your first paragraph. Firstly, we can see that there are the sperm has been fertilized from a mating partner as well as other nearby males. So that means that there are many males that are mating with the female. And the more males that are mating increases the chances of fertilization. And then the second thing we can pick up is that... Um, that, sorry, that there are many gametes released. They are releasing a batch of eggs. It's not just one egg at a time and that the um, male is releasing sperm. So many gametes would then also increase the chances of fertilization. And we can even go for a third option that the frogs are close to each other. So that will ensure that fertilization happens at a higher rate. So if I just show in the memo, because I just listed three options for you, that they only asked for two. So they will only mark your first two answers, even though there are three. And if you provide three, they're only going to make mark your first two. So what I'm saying is be sure of your first two answers if you're going to list more than two. And there it is. So the frogs are close to each other, many males mate with the female, and many gametes are released. They're not asking you to explain how to increase the chances of fertilization. They just ask you to state how it does that. And then if we look at the next question, give two functions of the foam nests, again, for two marks. So here we look, and there are many functions of it. Please, you can list them, but and make sure that, again, you have your first two you're sure of, because there are more than two answers, um, and they will only mark the first two. So if we look here, it says the nest, prevent dehydration. So you can say that, prevents dehydration. You can say that um, it protects the eggs during, um, protects the eggs from predation. Don't just say predation. Rather, tell them the function of it. So protects the um, eggs or the embryos or the tadpoles from predation. Then you can say um, prevents bacteria and fungi from um, destroying it. And you can also say provides a healthy environment for the developing embryos. So what I'm saying is you can't necessarily just use the words as is because that's not telling them the function. So just be able to 
give the function in a sentence. So I'll quickly show you what the memo says so you can see where the marks are awarded. So the marks were awarded for preventing dehydration of the developing embryos. So the mark there was preventing dehydration because that's given the function. The next one is protecting the developing tadpoles from predation. So again, like I said, you can't just use the word predation and hope to get the mark. You need to give the function. Then prevents microbial degra um, degradation, which like I said, um, prevents the fungi and bacteria from destroying it and then provides a healthy environment for the embryos. Two marks, and then mark the first two. Any questions before we go on? No questions at the moment. Okay. All right, let's go to 2.3. So the diagram below represents a reflex arc. So again, I go about by firstly labeling what I can see. So firstly, I look at the arrows because that's giving me a lot of information. So the arrows are showing the direction of the impulse. So the impulse is going along this way, we'll go there and then we'll go out that way. So then once I've identified the direction of the impulses, I can now go about labeling the different neurons. So neuron A, is sending the impulses towards the spinal cord. So that neuron would be the sensory neuron. Then B would be the neuron that is inside the spinal cord, and it's the one between neuron A and neuron C. So it'd be your connector neuron or interneuron. You can use any one. And then neuron C would be going away from the spinal cord, taking the impulses away to the effector. So that would be a motor neuron. So that's what I've identified so far. Then we can look at the questions. So the first question is, what is a reflex arc? And here, reflex arc, you have to know that definition for reflex arc action and it is for two marks. So if we look at our memo, this is your answer. So a reflex arc, it's the pathway along which nerve impulses are transmitted from a re receptor to an effector to bring about a reflex action. Okay, so reflex arc, it's a pathway and now you just think, okay, well, how's that pathway of what? It's of the impulses from receptor. And then you know it goes along all the different neurons to the effector, that final muscle gland, to bring about a reflex action. And it's two or nothing marks. So please make sure that you know that definition. Then the next one says, explain the effects on the reflex action when neuron C is damaged. So it's an explain question on reflex action. So that's bringing about the response. That's what the reflex action is on when neuron C is damaged. So this is why it's good to identify the different neurons before starting this question, because we've identified now that neuron C is the motor neuron. So if neuron C is damaged, let's just say it's damaged over there, just an example, how would that affect the reflex action? So how would that affect how I respond to the scenario? So for this one, we're going to start off with the person would be able to feel their sensation. Neuron A is working perfectly fine. It has no damage to it. So you'd say that the person would be able to feel the sensation. That would get you one mark. But then they would not be able to react to the stimuli. So they could feel the sensation. 
but they can't react to it, to the stimulus, which is caught bringing on this reflex action. So they may not be able to move, if that's an example, if that's a situation, but they can feel it. So if I stepped on a thorn, I'd be able to feel the pain, but I wouldn't be able to lift my foot up. So that would be the example to it. But I want you to use it now just based on the general sense. So you would say that the person would be able to feel the sensation, one mark, but they would not be able to react to the stimuli, second mark. 2.3.3, name the disorder that is a result in the breakdown of the myelin sheath of neurons. So again, there are two disorders that you need to know with regards to the nervous system. That would be Alzheimer's disease, and the other one would be multiple sclerosis. So Alzheimer's disease would be degeneration, of the neuron tissues and typically in the brain. And then your multiple sclerosis is um, the breakdown of the myelin sheath of neurons. So for 2.3.3, they want you to name the disorder and myelin sheath. The answer would be multiple sclerosis. Let's write that for you. In a way to potentially remember it, myelin sheath, MS, and then MS for multiple sclerosis. But please write out the full name. Okay, any questions before I go on? No questions at the moment. But maybe we can just hear from the schools if they maybe need a bit more time to answer the questions themselves before you give them the answers or if they're happy with the pace that we're working at the moment. So maybe if they can just give us an indication in the chat regarding that. Now, yeah, just wait till they answer before we move on. Okay, the first message came through, happy with the pace, so we're good to go. Okay, now I know it, it's a lot of work to get through in three hours, so I know um, sometimes it is nice for students to answer by themselves and then for me to go through it, but um, I would like to get through as many questions to give you guys as many tips as possible for the final examinations. But if you need me to slow down or to re-explain or give you time to answer, please put it in the chat and then I'm happy to do that. Okay, 2.4, the autonomic nervous system controls all involuntary actions in the human body and conducts impulses from the central nervous system. So 2.4.1, Name two locations that impulses from the autonomic nervous system are conducted to. So two locations and the impulses are conducted to. Remember, they're going away from the central nervous system. So where are they going to? And they're controlling involuntary actions. So what would be an involuntary location, if I can put it that way, in your body that these impulses will be taken to. Well, the one you can think of automatically, what is a muscle or tissue in our body that we cannot control that is involuntary? And that would be then your heart muscle. So that would be one. Then out of your other muscles, you've got your voluntary muscles, your smooth muscles, and your cardiac muscles. I've already done cardiac muscles. But your smooth muscles are also um, involuntary. We cannot control it ourselves. So our autonomic nervous system will um, impulse us there. And again, a third possible option would be glands. So we have three options for this one. 
and then one to two locations. So again, you only list two, and you could list any two, but we mark the first two. So your heart muscles, your smooth muscles, and your glands. And then the next one, 2.4.2, this question has been um, popping up a lot. It says describe, so again, it's a describe, the functioning of the autonomic nervous system, and it's for five marks. Now, in the little text, starting the question off, they said the autonomic nervous system controls all involuntary actions. Now, you would know that the autonomic nervous system is broken up into two parts, being the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And then you need to think, when is each one going to be stimulated? So your sympathetic nervous system will be stimulated in your fight or flight mode. And under what hormone would stimulate that fight or flight mode, that emergency situation, um, what hormone would be stimulated? So that would be under adrenaline. And then your body goes into this heightened mode, various um, changes happen to your body, such as your pupils dilate, increased heart rate, etc. But remember, your body can't stay in that state. So your parasympathetic nervous system brings the body back down to, if I put it to normal, so restores the body and brings it to normal. So how do we answer that question for five marks? So remember to describe and the functioning of the autonomic nervous system. So let's look at the memo answer. So firstly, because I said to you consist of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, and they work oppositely, and that will give you that is explaining the first two points here. Every organ gland is controlled by two sets of nerves that acts antagonistically. Remember, antagonistically is oppositely, so in opposite directions. Then we'd say the autonomic nervous system is divided into your sympathetic nerves and your parasympathetic nerves. And now you're explaining them describing what the sympathetic nerves do and the parasympathetic nerves do. So the sympathetic nerves are stimulated in a fight or flight mode, so emergency st situation. And your parasympathetic nervous systems, they stop it. So they stop that response and restores the body to normal. So we have that uh, the gland or organs controlled by two sets of nerves that act antagonistically. And then you can see your parasympathetic nerve stimulates, and this will be in a fight or flight situation, emergency situations. And your parasympathetic nerves would inhibit a response and bring your body back down to normal. So that's how we would describe how the autonomic nervous system functions. Okay. And remember, you do need to know what are the responses underneath the sympathetic nervous system to your body and what are the responses bringing it back down to normal in a parasympathetic, um, when the parasympathetic nerves have inhibited the response. Okay. So we have about 10 minutes left, and then I'm going to give you a short break, and then we'll move on to paper two. So we'll go on to the next question, 2.5. Right, so moving on to the female reproductive system, but more importantly, the menstrual cycle and the hormones. So my tip for you is to know the female hormones and what they do and what their functions of them and especially the relationship between progesterone and FSH which is a negative feedback system and how they work with each other so when you study this section make sure you know the different hormones what's it being secreted by and their functions 
Okay, so let's start with this question. The graph below shows the hormonal changes in a female's body during pregnancy. So that's your key word in this case, is that we're looking at a female during pregnancy. So don't think it's during um, her normal menstrual cycle. And we can see we've got time at the bottom, we've got the hormone levels in the blood, and they're showing progesterone, estrogen, and prolactin. So that's the information I can see on the graph. And then they say progesterone from structure A, and that's for about the first few weeks, just over 10 weeks. And then we have progesterone from structure B, which will be almost for the remainder of the pregnancy, so about 40 weeks, just before 40 weeks, sorry, like 37 weeks. And then we have prolactin coming up and estrogen was also there and then decreasing. So a lot of information on this graph. So again, let's start off by trying to fill in structure A and structure B. So if this is with a female that is pregnant, we know progesterone has to be secreted. Why? To maintain the endometrium lining so that a miscarriage doesn't happen. So progesterone needs to be secreted. What structure starts off with secreting progesterone in the beginning? Well, that would be the corpus luteum. And then corpus luteum will secrete some in the beginning while the next structure is busy forming. And the next structure that will secrete progesterone for the remainder of the pregnancy would be the placenta. So this placenta takes over that role of secreting progesterone. So first the corpus luteum until the placenta is formed and then the placenta will secrete progesterone. Okay, so let's look at the questions. Identify the following structures. So we've just done that. So structure A would be secreting progesterone in the beginning, would be the corpus luteum. And then structure B, secreting progesterone later on, and for almost the full duration, would be the placenta. 2.5.2 would say name the gland where prolactin is produced. So that's important because you do need to know the different um, glands of the endocrine system and what they are each secreting. And in this case, it would be the pituitary gland or the hypophysis. Then the next one says, explain, so this is a cause and effect question, the high secretion of prolactin after week 40. So why is there a high secretion of prolactin after week 40? And it's an explain question. So we know that prolactin will then produce milk. And we know milk is important for the baby for growth and development, and it's a food source for the baby. So, but the question is, why is it so high after week 40? So here you're going to explain that it's high as the fetus has been born or the baby has been born. And why one high prolactin is because it's producing milk, which is the baby's food source. So we don't need prolactin when the female is pregnant and the fetus is still inside of her because she doesn't need to give milk to the fetus. Remember, all the nutrients are going through the umbilical cord. So the prolactin will only be high after the fetus is born to provide milk. So if we look at how they've given the marks for this one, just so that you can see. So one mark for saying the fetus was born after 40 weeks. And then you're going to say 
that the milk must be produced or the milk is its only food source. Uh, or it stimulates milk production to feed the baby. So anything along those lines about that it's now providing milk for the for the baby is important. But you need to make sure that you answer that first bullet point by saying the fetus was born after 40 weeks. Therefore, it's providing food, the milk for it, which is a food source. Okay, then the next one, explain the significance of the levels of estrogen and progesterone dropping towards the end of pregnancy. So again, it's an explain and it's a significance. So why is it important that the levels of estrogen and progesterone drop? Why is that important at the end of pregnancy? So you need to start off with, okay, in your head, you think, what is the role of estrogen and progesterone during pregnancy? And we know it's to maintain the endometrium. But now, when the female is at the end of pregnancy, do you still need to maintain the endometrium? No, you do not need to do that because you're about to give birth. So the estrogen and progesterone levels would decrease. And also, we need to remove the placenta. So remember, after giving birth to the baby, the placenta also needs to come out. So why are they low? So it's explaining and it's two marks. I'll show you on the memo. One mark for saying no longer needed to maintain the endometrium. So that's going to get you the one mark and allows the placenta to be removed that would get you the second mark so that everything can detach and come out during the birthing process. So it's important with this question, don't tell me what estrogen and progesterone do because that's not answering the question. They want to know why it's important that estrogen and progesterone levels are dropping at the end of pregnancy. And like I said, no need to maintain the endometrium and to allow the placenta to be removed. Okay, and then the last question, and then I will be a break. Describe the effect that the drop in progesterone level has on the ovarian cycle. And like I said to you, it's important that you are able to tell the examiner or be able to answer the relationship between progesterone and the ovarian cycle and so progesterone and fsh so this one's saying the effect so again it's a describe the effect of a drop in progesterone so if there is a decrease in progesterone we know that more fsh would be secreted because they work almost in opposite directions so a decrease in progesterone would mean more FSH is secreted. And you need to think, well, what's secreting FSH? The pituitary gland. So that will answer the first bit. I just want to show you. So the drop in progesterone levels stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete FSH. Now you need to think, okay, what does FSH do? Well, it's follicle stimulating hormone. So it would stimulate the primary follicle to develop into a graphin follicle, and that eventually would lead to ovulation, to an ovum being released. So that would get your next marks. So low progesterone, that would stimulate the pituitary gland to secrete more FSH, which will stimulate the development of the primary follicle into a graphin follicle, and the total final effect of that would be that it leads to ovulation. Important that you're able to describe it because they often ask that question just in different ways. They could say a female's taken a contraceptive pill, which is high in progesterone, explain the effect on the ovarian cycle. Then you're just doing the reverse of this. So know that progesterone FSH work in a negative feedback mechanism and that 
a high level in progesterone would result in low FSH being secreted or a low um, level of progesterone res will result in more FSH being secreted. And then you just think, well, if there's more FSH, primary follicle will develop into a graphene follicle, which will lead to ovulation. But if FSH is inhibited, then this process won't take place. So then you would say the primary follicle won't develop into a graphene follicle and no ovulation would take place. So it's important you know that. Okay, so paper two, like we looked at the weighting earlier on today, there are less topics and evolution in genetics has the highest weighting. So we're going to start off with the multiple choice questions and I'm going to give you five minutes to do it and you can put the answers in the chat as you go along. Okay, let's start. So again, multiple choice questions and you only write down one letter next to the question number. So starting off with 1.1.1, which one of the following correctly describes the four cells produced by meiosis. So we know meiosis, the point is to create gametes, and we know that gametes have to have half the chromosome number, so they would be haploid. So automatically, I can cross out the diploid options because we know meiosis is there to create haploid cells. Then we look at the other the next part. So option A says that they are haploid and genetically different. And option D says they're haploid and genetically identical. Now we know that during meiosis, there are different things taking place which increases variation and makes the cells different to each other. For example, crossing over, and the other one would be random arrangements of chromosomes. So they are not genetically identical to each other. So the answer for this one would be A, haploid and genetically different. Now, mitosis would mean that we are creating more somatic cells, body cells, so they would be diploid, and the cells would be genetically identical to each other. So that would be the differences between meiosis and mitosis. So meiosis is haploid, four cells, and they're genetically different. Mitosis would be diploid, and the cells are genetically identical. 1.2.2, the diagram below shows a cell during prophase one and they want to do the labels. So again, we go and we quickly put in the labels. So X is going to be the spindle fibers. We can see that's being formed. Then Y would be centromere. And remember, do not get confused between centromere and centrioli. Remember, centrioles are producing the spindle fibers. And then Z would be your homologous chromosomes. So now we look at the questions and it says which one of the following are the correct labels for X, Y, and Z. So let's have a look at our options. So option A says Z is spindle fiber. Yes. Y is centrioli. No. We know that centromere and Z is chromosome. So we put an X there. Option B, X is centrioli. No, it's a spindle fiber, so we put an X over there. C, X is spindle fiber, yes. Y is centromere, yes. And Z is homologous chromosomes, yes. So that's correct. But remember, we just check that we have it's all correct. And then D, X is centromere, no. no. So we know then the answer for 1.1.2 is C. Right, 1.1.3, which one of the following is the biological importance of meiosis? So why is meiosis important? So again, we go through our option. Does it repair worn out tissues? No. Is it production of gametes in humans? Yes. 
Is it production of somatic cells in humans? No. Is it responsible for growth in organisms? No. So your answer is B. If they asked for mitosis, then your other options would all be correct, A, C, and D. But they asked in meiosis. That's why it's important to highlight or underline those key words so that you can answer correctly. Right, 1.1.4 says how many mRNA nucleotides, so we want to know nucleotides, code for protein made up of 120 amino acids. Now we know that one amino acid is made up of three codons, which would then be three nucleotides, because each codon would be made up of a nucleotide. So in this case, they're saying we have 120 amino acids. How many nucleotides would there be? So all you would do here is you take 120 and you times it by three to get you the answer of 360. So your answer for 1.1.4 would be 360. So like I said, one amino acid has three nucleotides, so you would just times it by three. 1.1.5. The diagram below represents the appendages of four different organisms. Which two limbs are homologous structures? So remember with homologous structures, so their structure is the same, but they have different functions. Homo means the same. So the structure of the limb would be the same, but they would use it for different purposes. So if we look over here, if I compare P and Q, their structure does not look like the same. If I compare P and R, their structure looks the same. They've got the phalanges, um, the carpals, etc. And P and S, they don't look the same. So the closest ones that have similar structure but would use it for different functions. So that bats would use it for flying, humans would use it for picking up things, writing, etc. Would be P and R. So your answer would be C. 1.1.6. Speciation has occurred when. Now, speciation is when a new species is formed. And we know the definition of a species, it's similar organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. So that's the definition of what a species is. So now let's go through the list of speciation. So speciation has occurred when two populations can no longer interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Yes, because remember speciation forming new species. So that's possibly correct. We still look at the other answers. Populations are separated by geographical barrier. Now, they haven't specified here if it's reproductive isolation speciation or geographical one, because remember it can happen both ways. So we can't just have that one only. Populations go extinct. That's not always the case. They form a new species and a mutation has occurred in an individual organism. That's not the case. So we know that speciation has occurred when two new species has formed. And we know two new species has formed when they can't interbreed. Well, when they can interbreed, but they can't produce fertile offspring or they just can't interbreed anymore. So your option for 1.1.6 is A. Right, 1.1.7, the chromosome complements in a cell of an individual who inherits an X chromosome from the father is. Okay, so remember, the father determines the sex of the child. So we know that the mother is XX, 
and the father is X, Y. So the mother will always give an X chromosome to the, to the offspring, and the father will either give an X or a Y. But now in this case, they said he gave an X chromosome. So that would mean that the person has two X chromosomes. So we are already going to eliminate option B and option D. Then we look at the rest of the information. So we know in a human there are 46 chromosomes. There are 44 autosomes and two gonosomes, and those gonosomes determine the sex of the child. So if we look at the options, 44 and XX, that would equal 46 in total, 44 autosomes, and then your two gonosomes. Or is it option C, which has 46 autosomes and two gonosomes given 48? No. So we know that the chromosome complements of this in of this individual would be a it would be 44 and x x okay. we'll go on to 1.1.8 and 9 that both refer into the dye hybrid cross so in rabbits fur color and the fur length are controlled by two genes and they said it's a dye hybrid cross. So we have black fur is dominant over white fur, and long fur is dominant over short fur. And they've given you the letters there. Capital B, small b, capital L, little l. Two rabbits, one and two are mated. The table below shows the possible gametes that can be produced by each rabbit. And then the question says, which one of the following is the phenotype of rabbit 2? Okay, so we look at rabbit 2's gametes. I can see that it has a capital B and a little b. So if it's got a capital B and a little b, so if it's this, we know that the dominant allele will um, be present in its phenotype, so we know that it would have black fur. Then I also see the L's. It's got a capital L and a little L. So then I can say, sorry, capital L, little L, that it will have long fur. So my answer for this one, the phenotype would have black long fur. And the option for this one would be D. How do I know that? Because it's got a dominant allele present, you can see automatically. So that would be expressed in the phenotype, being black fur. And it has a dominant um, allele for the length of the fur coat. So it has a capital L present. So that would be expressed in the phenotype given it black long fur. 1.1.9, which one of the following are possible genotypes of the offspring of rabbit one and two? So rabbit one and two mate, what would the possible genotypes of the offspring be? So now we look, remember each rabbit gives an allele. So what I notice straight away is that in rabbit one, there are no big letters, no big B, no big L. They're only given little Bs and little Ls. So they're not getting a capital B. There will only ever be one capital B present in the offspring's genotype. So if I look at my options, I can already eliminate the ones that have two capital letters of either B's or L's. So I'm going to eliminate option B because it's got capital B, capital B. It's getting cap one capital B from rabbit two, but where's it getting the second capital B from? Not from rabbit one. So that's why I know it's not that one. Then I can cross out um, 
option C as well, again, because it's got capital B, capital B, and capital L, capital R. There's no second capital B. Rabbit one's not given a capital B gamete allele. Then if I look at option D, it's got no two capital Bs, but it does have a capital L, capital L. And again, rabbit two's got a capital L, yes, but rabbit one does not have a capital L to give to its offspring. So it can't be option D. So what is left behind? Only option A. Because it can get two small Bs from both parents. It can get two small Ls. It can get one capital B, one small B, one capital L, one small L, and so on. So you have to look at that. You've got to remember that for each um, allele, it's getting one from each parent. So you need to see, can it get little b from um, the first one? Yes. Can it get little b from the second one? Yes. Okay, let's go on to 1.10. So here they say a woman with blood group A married a man and had four children with blood groups as shown in the diagram below. And you need to work out the genotype of the man. So they're saying the mother is going to be blood group A. So we know, I always fill this in on top, what are the two options for her um, her blood group, or I mean for her genotype? Could be I capital A, just remember that superscript, and I capital A, or it can be I capital A little i. Okay, just remember the A's are superscript. I just can't um, do that on here. And they had these four children. So now two children, which I noticed straight away, is going to be child two. Why? Because they have blood group O, which means their genotype is little i, little i. And that means they have to get a recessive allele from the mom and a recessive allele from the the dad. So I can automatically say that the mom is not going to be that. She has to be that. So now I can look at my options over here. And so I can really cross out, well, it's not going to be option B, because remember the dad has to have a recessive allele. So I'm going to cross out option B and I'm going to cross out option C, because there's no recessive allele there. Then I look at, okay, child A can get maybe the A allele from the mom and child 3 can get the A allele from the mom. But what is interesting is going to be child 4, which has blood group B. And we know that the two options, sorry, for blood group B can either be I capital B superscript I capital B or it can be I capital B little i. And where is it getting the B allele from? It's not getting it from the mother. So that means it has to get it from the father. And that would mean out of the two options left, A or D, that the option would be D. The correct answer would be D. So 1.2.1, a point where chromatids overlap during crossing over. So the first one was... Uh... A chiasmata and the other one was a chiasma. So both of them are correct. One is just plural and the other one isn't. So it doesn't matter which one you use, both of them would be accepted. Okay, 1.2.2 is segment of DNA that codes for a particular protein. So I think we have three different schools who answered and they all said gene. Gene is correct. Next one, a phase before cell division during which DNA replication takes place. So all of the answers that came through, interphase. Interphase is correct. They quite often ask that question, so I'm glad they've all got it correct. Okay. Genetic material that is used to trace female ancestry. So that's, a, and it's genetic material. So those are key words in that one. What did, did anyone give an answer there? Yes. So the answers that came through, mitochondrial DNA. 
Correct. So mitochondrial DNA is the answer. When it comes to terminology, please write out the full name where possible. So do not write mtDNA, rather write mitochondrial DNA. Okay, 1.2.5, a pattern of dark bands derived from genetic material and that is unique to each individual. We have DNA profile. DNA profile is correct. Then evolution characterized by long periods of little or no change followed by short periods of rapid change. There we have punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium is correct. A group of organisms with similar characteristics occupying the same habitat at the same time and are able to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Here you have two different answers. The first one that came through was population. And the second one that came through was species. Yes, yeah, so those are two we often get confused with. And that's why I highlighted that they occupy or live in the same habitat. So that should mean that it's definition for population. So the definitions are very similar when you look at them at first. But population refers to them living in that same area at the same time. A species would just be a group of organisms with similar characteristics that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. So be careful and look if they're talking about the same habitat. And you do need to know those definitions um, word for word because it does pop up um, as questions in past exams. Then 1.2.8. The change in the genetic composition of a species over time? No answers for that. Okay, so for this one, it is evolution. So because it's a change over time, that would tell you that it was evolution and a change in the genetic composition. We know that is the fundamentals of um, allowing um species to form and evolution to take place okay so let's, just before you move sorry. on ma'am mm. um one of the schools just posted micro evolution um i would avoid the difference between micro and macro evolution and rather stick to just evolution okay one point three We've got the columns again, so we're just going to go through this quite quickly. So 1.3.1, evidence for evolution, and we have biogeography, and we have meiosis. So in this one, the evidence for evolution, we know that there is a few lines of evidence, being fossil, genetic, biogeography, um, homologous structures, etc. This one would be A only. Sorry, there we go. So this one would be A only. Meiosis is not evidence for evolution. It contributed to genetic variation and creates a new species, but it's not evidence for it. 1.3.2, site of meiosis. So where does meiosis occur? Does it occur in the uterus? No. Does it occur in the ovaries? Yes. So it would be B only. And then 1.3.3, an event that occurs during metaphase 2. So they're talking about metaphase in this situation. Crossing over, no. We know crossing over happens in prophase 1. Random arrangement of chromosomes, yes. So it would be B only. Okay. Then we will go on. Right, now they've given us a pedigree diagram. And a pedigree diagram does pop up in paper two. So if you struggle with it, just go through some past papers to get familiar with how it works. And again, it's important to read the text they give you because it has a lot of information in it. 
So let's start. So albinism is a skin disorder caused by a recessive allele on an autosome. So in other words, if they have the recessive allele, they would need two of them, they would have albinism. The pedigree diagram below represents the inheritance of albinism in a family, and they've given you the letters, use N for normal skin and little n for albinism. And like I said, they've given you the letters. Please do not use other letters, only the letters they gave you. This is not a sex-linked disease because it's on an autosome. So we're not going to have X's and Y's here. So I start off with the pedigree diagram with looking at all the information that they've given us. And I start to first fill in the different genotypes that we get. So starting off with the ones that have albinism, because they can only have one genotype, they would then have little n, little n, and the female would also have little n, little n. Because remember, it's not sex linked. And then if they don't have albinism, then it could be capital N, capital N, or it could be heterozygous, capital N, little n. Same for the male, capital N, little n, I'm sorry, capital N, capital N, capital N, little n. So that's the first bit of information before I even look at the questions. And what I typically do is I then go and try and fill in all the genotypes on the pedigree diagram that I can. So I start off with the ones I definitely know, which are the ones with albinism. So they would have all little n's. And then I would now go and work out the others. So if I start off with this person over here, they have two recessive alleles which means they had to get one recessive allele from the dad and one recessive allele from the mother. And we know the mom and the dad don't have it, so the two possible genotypes are capital N, capital N, or capital N, little n. And because they have to get a recessive allele to their child, we know then that their genotype would be heterozygous. Cap and then if I look at this person, X, again, the same situation. They have two recessive alleles, which means they got two recessive alleles. I mean, which means they got a recessive allele from each parent. And again, for these, um, for this child with their parents Y and Z, they had to get a recessive allele from each parent. And the last one, W, is an unknown one. So we can't yet decide if they are um, capital N, capital N, or capital N, little n. So there's are two options for that person. We don't have enough information yet to decide that. Okay, so let's look at the questions. So the first question, 1.4.1, how many generations are represented in the pedigree diagram? So here you just go and count the lines. How many lines are there? So there was your first generation over here. This would be your second generation. This would be your third generation. And this would be your fourth generation over there. So the answer would be four. Then it says 1.4.2. Give the phenotype of individual W phenotype, so that's what's physically being expressed, what we can physically um, see in this situation, and it's normal, we can see it's a square that's not shaded, so your answer would be male without albinism. Then it says, give the genotype of individual X, so we know X is shaded female, which means she has albinism. So then she can only have one possible genotype, which would be then your little n, little n, which we've done. Then they want the genotype of individual W, uh, individual Y. So again, the genotype, so Y is a male 
without albinism. Remember, there's the two options. They could be homozygous dominant or they could be heterozygous, but they, you have to look at their offspring. They had a child which is fully recessive. So they means they got one recessive allele from the mom and one recessive allele from the dad. So Y's genotype would then be capital N, little n. Then they say, what is the percentage chance of individuals Y and Z having a child without albinism? So if we quickly did a Punnett square, we would see. So individual Y is heterozygous and Z is heterozygous. So if I had to quickly draw Punnett square, sorry, I know it's not neat. And we did the one up here. And little n. If we had to just fill that in, oops. Okay, they wanted to know the percentage of them having a child without albinism. So that means they. The child needs just one dominant allele, and then it doesn't have albinism. So it would be this block. Let me just do a tick, sorry. So it would be this block, this block, and this block. And we know each block counts 25%. So your total would be 75%. So they'd have a 75% chance of having a child without albinism, and then 25% chance with having a child with albinism. Any questions before we go on? Not at the moment. Yep. 1.5, so the diagram below shows a short section of a DNA molecule. And it's a DNA molecule that's important to underline or highlight when you get questions like this. And we can see a lot of information there. And we start off again by just labeling. So let's label A. So A would be a sugar molecule. But now, because it's a DNA molecule, what sugar would it be? You have to specify. So this would be deoxyribose. Then B would be a nitrogenous base. But we can see it's bonded to T. So this would be what bonds to T would be A, which would be adenine. And then C would be the bond between the nitrogenous bases, which would be your hydrogen bonds. Okay, so that's what I filled in just based on the information that I can see. Now we can start the question. So the first question, 1.5.1 says, what is the natural shape of a DNA molecule? And they always ask this question. And the natural shape would be a double helix. Then they say, identify sugar A, which you've already identified. So that's deoxyribose. Then it says, identify the nitrogenous base B, full name required. Now, whenever they give you a diagram and they ask you for the name of the base, and it's just one base, then you must please give the full name. And like I said, in this case, it was adenine. And then 1.5.2C, they wanted bond C, which we said was your hydrogen bonds doesn't matter if you put weak hydrogen bonds, as long as you have hydrogen bonds there, you would get the mark. Then 1.5.3 says give two visible reasons why the diagram above represents a DNA molecule. Visible. So what we can see in the diagram. So there are options you can go for. There are three options. And remember, you always write down you put down two and you make sure that they are the most correct ones, the ones you most sure are. So how do I know that it's DNA visible? Well, firstly, I can see that it's double-stranded. OK, 
Okay, it's got two strands to it, so double stranded. There's the one, there's the other one. I could say that it has thymine instead of uracil. We know uracil will be found in your RNA. So having that thymine there shows that it is DNA. And then you can also say that the nitrogenous bases are in pairs. Because remember, your RNA would be single stranded, so they're not necessarily in pairs. So, but the obvious ones, it's double stranded and the thymine is present and not uracil. And then the next one says, name two structures in a non-dividing human cell where DNA is found. So where do we find DNA? So, and it's in a non-dividing human cell. So for this answer, it would be, we know that DNA is found in the nucleus. And that we also know it will be found in mitochondria. It is found in chloroplasts, but chloroplasts are only found in plants. And they specifically asked for, uh, for humans, sorry. So then we say nucleus and mitochondria. Right, any questions before we go on to section B? No questions in the chat. Yeah. All right, let's go to question two. So again, similar type of questions often pop up about what we're going to work through now. And there are always things that might catch you out. So just follow a process and approach as calmly and read all the information that they give you. All right, so 2.1, a sequence of nitrogenous bases in a DNA molecule is shown below. So they gave you C, 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 G, G, T, T, C, A. So the first one says, write down the mRNA codon sequence that reads from left to right from the DNA sequence above. So we know that this is DNA. They've told us in the text that this is DNA. So now they want the mRNA one. So now we're just going to do the complementary basis. But remember, it's DNA. I mean, it's from DNA to RNA. So certain things would then change. Okay, so CCC would become GGG. And then we'll have CCA. And then we'll have AGU. Remember? Because it's RNA, there's no T present, thymine present. It's U for uracil. So that would be your answer. G, 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 C, C, A, A, G, U for 2.1.1. So that's your mRNA code. Then 2.1.2 says the table below shows the tRNA anticodons and their corresponding amino acids. Now that's important tRNA anticodons. So that's the information they're giving you there. So now they say, write down the amino acids in the correct sequence that would be coded for by the DNA molecule above. Okay, so now how we start this. So this is why I say you just got to uh, just think of the sequence. So we have DNA, then it gets, we get mRNA, which has the codon, and then tRNA, which has the anticodon. So in this situation, I'm going to take each codon at a time. So starting off with the first one, CCC, the codon, changed to the, sorry, CCC, the DNA, changed to the codon on mRNA, GGG. And then that would change, what would the anticodon be? The complementary one would be CCC, which means that amino acid, that's anticodon codes for the amino acid. We find CCC, there it is, which will be glycine. So that would be your first one. Okay, then we do the next one. So we have GGT, 
which will get co which the codon would be CCA and the anticodon would be GGU. Okay, remember the T changes to U because we're working with tRNA. So that we go find GGU, there it is, and the amino acid will be proline. And then your last one, I'm going to move this down just so you can see that, would be TCA, which we know the codon would be AGU. And then if we had to do the anticodon for that one, it would be UCA. We find UCA, which is over here, and that codes for serine. So your final one, I need to write the amino acids in the correct sequence. So please make sure you do this correctly. Your final answer would be glycine, proline, and then serine. So that would be your answer for 2.1.2. So it's important to remember that DNA will then code and have a complementary code on, which is on mRNA, which has a complementary anticodon, which is on tRNA, and from there you work it out. What you would notice is that DNA and tRNA often have the same bases. The only difference is that T would be replaced by U. So sometimes you don't have to do all those steps, but doing all these steps like I did helps you to see it um, just so that you don't make a mistake. Um, so what is important is to look what information they give you. So when they ask for the name of the amino acids, you need to look at what are they giving you. Are they giving you the codon? Are they giving you the anticodon? Or are they giving you DNA? That's important because that does change and that would then determine how you would work out the amino acids. Okay. Then 2.1.3 says during transcription, the first triplet in the DNA sequence changed from CCC to ACC. Explain how this would affect, sorry, explain how this would affect the protein that is formed. Okay, so now they're saying, I'm just doing it up here so we can see everything. CCC changed to ACC. So what would that result in? That would result in the codon changing. So the original codon was GGG, but now that codon is going to change to UGG. And if the codon changes, then we know the anticodon would change. So the anticodon would now be so if it's UGG, it would now be um, ACC. And that then would mean that the amino acid, you've got to go find it in the table, would be tryptophan instead of the original one, which we've already coded, was glycine. And if there's a different amino acid, that would then result in a different protein being formed. So again, you've got to take it step by step. I'm going to quickly show you on the memo now what the answers look like and where you get the marks for, because that is important. And they like to ask that type of question. When some um, base changes, what would the effect be? And that's important. You need to explain how this would affect the protein being formed. Okay, so if we look at the answer here, so like I said, firstly, the codon will change, and you need to tell them what the codon changes to. So the codon changed to UGG, which means the anticodon changed to ACC. And what would that and what would the effect be? Well, then a different amino acid will be brought and specified. So then tryptophan will be brought um, instead of glycine and the final effect of it that's what you need to end, I always say end your story off explain how this would affect the protein being formed a different protein will be formed or well, obviously the sequence of amino acids will change which would then ultimately 
result in a different protein being formed. Okay. So like I said, they like to ask those questions. So always just take it step by step. Okay, if there's a change in the DNA base. How does it affect the codon? How does it affect the anticodon? And how does it affect the amino acid? And lastly, it would then, does it affect the protein being formed? Yes, in this case, because different amino acids were brought to it. Right, and then the next question says, Describe the role of tRNA in translation. So we know what tRNA's role is. It's there to carry a specific amino acid to the codon on the mRNA, which is by the ribosome. So it carries a specific amino acid. Remember, it picks up the amino acid and takes it to the codon on the mRNA codon. It's complementary one, and eventually it would then form the protein. So it is important to know that that's part of your translation description, which you need to know, and it is um, also in your examination guidelines how to answer that. Then 2.1.5 says, tabulate um, to tabulate that means draw a table two differences between the process and this is important of dna replication and transcription so it's not tabulate the differences between dna replication and transcription it's between the processes of them it's for five marks out of those five marks one mark is awarded for drawing the table and then you'll get the marks for the differences. So let's have a look at the memo. Okay, so like I said, one mark for just drawing the table and then once the differences between the processes of DNA replication and transcription. So firstly, you're going to say two DNA strands are used as a template. You can't just say double-stranded, single-stranded. Now, it's not saying the difference between the processes of DNA replication. And remember, whatever you put on the one side, it needs to have its complement on the other side. So if you're talking about how many strands are used as a template for this side, you have to do the same over here. And in, in transcription, one DNA strand is used as a tem template. Then you would say, okay, what other differences occur in the processes? So here you would say um, DNA nucleotides join to the DNA template, or on transcription, you could say RNA nucleotides join to the DNA template. So the difference is DNA and RNA in that situation. Then you could have also said um, during DNA replication, the whole strand of DNA unwinds and in transcription, a part of the DNA molecule unwinds. And then you can say adenine pairs with thymine and in transcription, adenine pairs with uracil. You can't just say in DNA replication, thymine is present. Again, that's not answering the question, which is a difference in the processes. The process here is that adenine will pair with thymine. And in transcription, it's not just uracil is present, it's that adenine would then pair up with uracil. So it's about the processes. So make sure that you answer that one correctly. And like I said, you can't talk about how many strands are used as a template and then talk about here, adenine pairs up with uracil because then you'll only get one mark they have to complement each other so that would be your table so again we mark the first two and you get one mark for the table so again if you're going to put more options please make sure that your first two options are correct and that you're confident in them okay any questions no questions in the chat i just see a lot of great answers coming through oh that's great 
I'm happy and I'm sure they will be ready for their final examinations. I've still got a bit more time and but I'm looking forward to hopefully them getting good results. Okay, 2.2. The diagram below shows the karyotypes of male and female fruit flies. So we've got the male fruit fly, we've got the female fruit fly. So 2.2.1 says state what is meant by the term karyotype. And if we go look at our memo answer, I want to show you this because it's word for word what you would need to write down. So what is meant by karyotype? So that is the number and appearance of chromosomes in a cell of an organism. And again, it's two or nothing marks. You have to get it all correct or you don't get any marks. It's like that with all definitions in life sciences. So the karyotype is showing the number and the appearance of chromosomes in the cell of an organism. And that's exactly what we can see in our fruit fly example of the karyotype over here. So we can see where well, they've got the number of chromosomes. We can count them. We will now know. And the appearance. So they're not all exactly the same size, um, shape, length, etc. 2.2.2. What is the diploid number of chromosomes of the species of fruit fly? So they want you now to count how many chromosomes, the diploid number in this fruit fly. So now we let you just go and count how many chromosomes there are. So this will be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, so your answer for this one would be eight. If they asked for haploid, then it would be half of that, which would be four chromosomes. Then it says 2.2.3, describe how sex determination in fruit flies is similar to humans. So now we're talking about sex determination. So now we look at the sex. So the male fruit fly has an X and Y chromosome, and the female fruit fly has an X and X chromosome. Is that the same as humans? Yes, it is. So that's just how we would answer it. So we would say females are XX, and males are XY. That would get you your two marks because it is similar. Males and humans have the XY chromosome, and fruit fly and sorry, and female humans have the same XX. So, in other words, like I showed you on a multiple choice question, the female always gives the X chromosome, and the male will either give the X or the Y chromosome, therefore determining the sex of the organism, whether it's fruit flies or in humans, it works the same. Okay, going on to 2.3, so they say the gene for eye color in fruit flies is carried on the X chromosome and therefore sex length. So that's giving you important information. And then they say the allele for red eye color is dominant over the allele for white eye color, and they've given you the um, letters they want you to use. So for red eye color, it's X capital R. For white eye color, it's X little r. 2.3.1, it says states Mendel's law of dominance. And again, you have to know um, Mendel's laws. So if we go to the memo, again, I just want to show you, there are two options for Mendel's law of dominance. You can say, when two homozygous organisms with contrasting characteristics are crossed, all the individuals of the F1 generation will display the dominant trait. So in other words, they just basically said, I'm using other letters now, B, um, B and little b, little b are crossed, 
all of them will have the dominant trait and will display it, which they'll all be heterozygous and they would all display the dominant trait. Or you could word it, an individual that is heterozygous for a particular characteristic will have the dominant trait as its phenotype, which we know. So if the organism is heterozygous, then the dominant trait will be expressed in its phenotype. So I just gave you the examples, but you need to put it in words and you can use any of them, whichever one is easier for you to remember, then go for that one. Okay, then 2.3.2, a heterozygous female is mated with a white-eyed male. So, let me first work out the genotypes of them. So, the heterozygous female, we would know needs to have one capital letter, one little letter, and because it's sex linked, and because it's female, it, we'll have to write it like this. So female, we know we have X and it's heterozygous. So X capital R, superscript please, like um, that example, and X little r, superscript as well. And then it's mated with a white-eyed male. White eyes recessive. Now we know a male has an X and a Y. And remember the Y doesn't carry an allele. Only the X chromosomes carry the allele. And because it's white-eyed, that means it has the recessive allele, so it put a little r superscript. So now it says, use a genetic cross to show the possible genotypes and phenotypes of the offspring. Seven marks. And they want a genetic cross. So that's that whole layout that you have to know. They will ask a question like this in your finals. And won't necessarily be this one, but they will ask a genetic cross. Okay, so let's have a look at the layouts and how you get your marks and what you need to remember. Okay, so firstly, we got to put P1 and F1 on the side so that's just referring to the parents and to the offspring and we start off with phenotype and they said in the description that it's a heterozygous female now you can't say for its phenotype it's a heterozygous female because you can't see physically heterozygous on an organism you can't see that it's capital r little r so you have to tell them it's physical traits and because, if I just go to the question, it's heterozygous, which means that it's got the dominant one, we would then say red eye color female. And they told us that it's crossed with a white eyed male. So that's the first mark that you're going to get over there. Then the genotype, we worked out the genotype just now. Because the female was heterozygous, it would have capital R, little r, and then the male has white eyes, so automatically has a recessive allele, and remember it's a male, so X, Y. Then you write meiosis, you leave that blank, then you write gametes, and we know the gametes, there'll be one um, for each of them, separated by commas, fertilization happens and then you write its genotype so typically we do like i think it's you they call it the foil method so you go like that to work out um the different sorry over there to work out the different ones that wasn't right well, this computer it's weird to work out all the different that was right and then you go the different genotypes. So that's what you do by fertilization. So if we look, then the genotype would be, well, X capital R and X small r, X capital R, um, Y, X small r with X small r, X small r with a capital Y. So that would be its genotype. And then the phenotype, yeah, you have to put the sex of the fruit fly in there. So over here, we can see that it has a dominant allele and it's two Xs. So that would be a red-eyed female, one. 
Then we look at the next one. It has a dominant allele, but it has a Y, so it'll be one red-eyed male. Then female, because there's two X chromosomes and there's two recessive alleles, so it'll be one white-eyed female. And lastly, we have a male, because it's an X and a Y, and it has a little R recessive allele, so it's one white-eyed male. And then, so how do you get your marks? So there's two compulsory marks. Because the question asked to show the possible genotypes and phenotypes, you get in two compulsory marks for showing that, which is over here, the text of the stars. And then you get any other five. So did you get the gametes right? Did you get the genotype correct, the phenotype correct? And then remember, you also get for having P1 and F1 in the right spot and meiosis and fertilization in the right spot. So this is for seven marks. Another way you could have done it is instead of showing like what I did over there, the FOIL method, you could have done a mini Punnett square to just show the gametes and then to show the genotypes because inside of there would be the genotypes. But the layout stays the same. So that's why I said it's so important to know the layout because you get in marks for P1 and F1 in the right spot and meiosis and fertilization. So even if you get the contents wrong, you still would get two out of seven marks. Cam, any questions? No questions at the moment. Then let's go on to 2.4. Right, so it says the histogram below shows a range of heights in a sample of rose plants. So it's showing the range of heights. So that's important information. So 2.4.1, what type of variation is shown by the height of rose plants? Now remember, we get two types of variation. We get continuous variation and discontinuous variation. So continuous variation shows a range of phenotypes, while discontinuous variation, there's no range of phenotypes. It's either that thing or that thing. There's like no in-between, in other words. So this is showing the, showing the height of rose plants, and you can see that there is a range. They're not all either 20 centimeters or 45 centimeters. There's a range of it. So therefore, the type of variation shown by rose plants, the height of rose plants, would be continuous variation. And then 2.4.2 says, give a reason for your answer in question 2.4.1. And like I said to you, the reason would be because there's a range of intermediate phenotypes, or there's a range of intermediate heights. There's not either this one or this one. Okay, so there's a range of intermediate phenotypes. Okay, 2.4.3. Rose flowers with long stems sell for the highest price because the long stem flowers look beautiful in a vase. Plant breeders select plants with the longest stems to interbreed. These long stem plants do not necessarily survive in the wild because wind can bend and break them. Explain how this practice of interbreeding long stem flowers is an example of artificial selection and not natural selection. Okay, so there was a lot of information over there. So firstly, they're talking about the long stems is the best and um, they sell the most and has the highest price. And plant breeders select the plants with the longest stems to interbreed. So that's important because the plant breeders are selecting the traits, which will mean that it would be artificial selection. It's not nature selecting them. Okay, so let's look at how 
And then, sorry, they go on to say that the long-stemmed ones don't survive in nature, really, because the wind can bend and break them. So the long stems don't have a high survival chance in nature, but to humans, it's beneficial. So the question, going back to it, says, explain how this practice of interbreed and long stem flowers is an example of artificial selection and not natural selection for four marks. Right, so let's look at the memo answer. So like I said, firstly, explain why it's artificial selection. That's the first half of it. So we're going to say, well, the plant breeders or the people select the characteristics. And in this case, they selected the roses with long stems. Okay, so that's how we know it's artificial selection and why it's not natural selection. We're going to explain now why, because it's not nature selecting the characteristic. So it's not nature. People selected the characteristic, not nature. So that's going to get you two marks. Then why else is it artificial selection and not natural selection? Well, it's because the people selected characteristics that are desirable to them because they want the roses with the long stems because they bring in the most money because people want it more. So they select the desirable characteristic. Well, that doesn't happen in natural selection. It's natural selection chooses the characteristic that is beneficial to the survival of the plant, the most suitable characteristic, enabling it to survive. So that's why it's not beneficial to survival. So in this scenario, in this question, they wanted you to explain why it's artificial selection and not natural selection. You can't just say, well, plant breeders select the characteristic that they desired. That's only going to get you two, as opposed to natural selection. So you always must read that question and make sure you're answering it um, correctly and fully so you can maximize the amount of marks you get, which in this case is four marks. Then it says, when rose plants with yellow flowers, are crossed with rose plants with red flowers. The offspring all have orange flowers. So I had a yellow flower crossed with the red flower, and then the offspring all had orange flowers. What type of dominance this is? Remember, we get three types, complete dominance, co-dominance, and incomplete dominance. Now this one, I have in yellow and red, and I make an orange, would be incomplete dominance because I'm getting a blend of those two um, phenotypes and that's been well, I'm getting a blend of those two characteristics which has been expressed in its phenotype. Co-dominance would be that I have a yellow flower with red spots on it something along, along those lines so both of those um, alleles and traits are expressed in its phenotype but because I'm having yellow and red and get an orange, we then call it incomplete dominance. And then it says, a plant breeder only has plants with orange flowers. Can she produce red offspring from these flowers? Explain your answer. So I'm just going to show you first by doing a Punnett square if she can, in fact, produce red flowers from only having orange. So orange is going to be your um, intermediate. So it's got a mix of the two. So in this case, we're going to say it has R and Y alleles. And they're going to then breed them. So two orange ones will keep breeding. And then they go said, well, can they ever produce red flowers? And there I can see straight away that two R's would give me red flowers. So the answer would be yes, they can produce red flowers, but now you need to explain it for the rest of the marks. So why can they produce those red flowers? Well, you would say the orange flowers 
each have a red allele. There it is, and there it is. So the orange flowers each have a red allele. And if they both pass on the red allele, they will produce a red flower. So I'll show you in the memo, just so you can see the word in. So we know yes, and you're gonna say the orange flowers each carry one red allele. And if both the plants pass on that red allele, then the offspring would be red. So I always suggest doing a mini Punnett square on the side and then explaining how you got to that Punnett square, that red, red, um, the capital R, capital R, because that would give you an answer for this one if you do struggle with the word and when it comes to genetic questions. So each orange flower has a red allele, and if they both pass on that red allele, then we would have a red flower. Okay, 2.5. So the diagram below shows a cell which has undergone a non-disjunction of chromosomes during meiosis. So non-disjunctions happened, and you should know what non-disjunction means, which is when the chromosomes fail to separate during anaphase. Um, and then they show now. So we started off with four chromosomes. So your 2N number or your diploid number would be 4. And under normal meiosis, we should end up with the cells having 2 each because remember we half the chromosome number. So it should go from 2 to 4. But non-disjunction happened. And I can see in this cell, I ended up with 3. So therefore, and this cell, I have 1. So that's after, sorry, so that's after meiosis one, where I should half the chromosome number and it should go from four to two to two, but instead I went from three to one to non-disjunction. Then meiosis two happens, which is just a copying division. So I'm just making more of those cells. The chromosome number stays the same. So in other words, this one would have three chromosomes, three chromosomes, and this would have one chromosome and one chromosome, as opposed to two chromosomes. Okay, so let's look at the questions. The first one says, during which phase of meiosis did this non-disjunction of chromosomes occur? So like I said to you, we know that non-disjunction happens in anaphase, but here you need to specify based on the picture they have given you. So they have shown you that in from meiosis, in meiosis one, it happened. You can see four chromosomes, and then it, the one got pulled to this side instead of going to this side. So the answer for this one is during anaphase one. And like I said, you have to specify that it's anaphase one. 2.5.2. Name the type of mutation that will result from non-disjunction of chromosomes. So remember, there's two types of mutations you need to know, gene mutation and chromosomal mutation. So gene mutations, when there's a change in the DNA or sequence or nitrogenous bases, a chromosomal mutation is when there would be an extra chromosome or one less chromosome. So in this case, Non-disjunction happened, which resulted in an extra chromosome here, which would then be that it's a chromosomal mutation. So the answer for 2.5.2 is chromosomal. 2.5.3, explain the disorder that will result from non-disjunction of chromosome pair 21 in humans. And you need to explain the disorder, and it's on chromosome pair 21. So we automatically know that it would result in Down syndrome because it's on chromosome pair 21. So now let's quickly look 
at how we would answer this one because it is for four marks. Okay, so how does, um, sorry, explain the disorder that will result from non disjunction in humans. So firstly, we would have an, a gamete with an extra copy of chromosome 21. So in other words, they would then be, you know, they will have an extra chromosome. Then that gamete fuses with the normal gamete. And as a result, the zygote will have 47 chromosomes. Or you could say it has an extra copy of chromosome 21. And lastly, what is that resulting? Because it's an explain in the disorder that would result in Down syndrome. So you would explain that the gamete would firstly, one gamete would have an extra copy of chromosome 21. And it's important that you specify where this copy is, on what position. And like I said, it's chromosome pair 21 or chromosome 21. Then that gamete fuses with a normal gamete. And as a result, the zygote ends up having 47 chromosomes with an extra, extra chromosome on chromosome 21. And the final results in the story of what would that result in? And that would then result in Down syndrome. So it is important that you are able to explain this. Just picture one extra chromosome fusing with a normal one would then equal 47 chromosomes. Because essentially, this gamete would be N plus 1. This gamete would be N. And as a result, we'd have 2N plus 1, which will give you your 47 chromosomes. That's just how you can picture it. But it is important that you get those word in, the wording correct and that you say gamete. It's not just a cell. You need to specify it's a gamete that has an extra chromosome and then it's a normal gamete and a zygote forms of 47 chromosomes. Okay, then it says draw cell A to show the chromosome. Sorry, Kaylee. Sorry, yes. There's a question in the chat. Um, how important is it to mention the phase of anaphase? Does it matter whether the learners mention anaphase one or anaphase two? Is this related to question 2.5.3? I am assuming so. Mm. Okay, so for 2.5.3, you have to look at the scenario that's given. In this case, they said will result from non-disjunction of chromosome P21. So then we can assume that it's anaphase 1. But they are lenient in this case. Um, if you, But please just put a number there. So make sure you're either talking about anaphase 1 or anaphase 2. For question 2.5.3, no marks were awarded for the phase because they were not asking for describe how non-disjunction occurs. Then we would go back and say, in anaphase one, the chromosome pairs fail to separate, an extra chromosome is pulled to one pole, and then we go on with the rest of the story. So if they asked for describe how non-disjunction takes place, then you must mention anaphase and refer to anaphase one or two. And like I said, in this case, because it was on the pairs, it's anaphase one. And then if they were referring to 2.5.1, you have to mention one or two. So hopefully that does answer the question. Okay, 2.5.4, draw cell A, like I said, to show the chromosome composition after meiosis 2 of the cell division. So they want to say cell A, and like I've said, so already this had three chromosomes, and meiosis 2 is just the copying division. So we would end up with the same number of chromosomes, and in this case, it would be three. But now remember, these are replicated chromosomes and would end up with unreplicated chromosomes or single chromosomes. So let me show you what it would look like. 
So there it is. So you have your single chromosomes and it needs to be three. And they want you to pay attention to the size of those chromosomes. So if I just go back here, they wanted, you had one big chromosome and two small ones. You've got to pay attention when you draw in them and make sure you have, again, one big chromosome, single chromosome, and then your two small ones as well. And that would get you your two marks. And then 2.5.5, name the type of cells that will be produced in a male at the end of meiosis. So the cells, type of cells produced in male at the end of meiosis. So remember, males will undergo spermatogenesis and they would end up producing your sperm cells or your spermatozoa but they would accept just sperm cells over here. And in females, we know that would eventually be an ovum. And remember the difference in sperm cells, they produce four per um, cell, and in um, females, it'll be one cell that is produced. Okay, that brings us to the end of question two, but that also brings us to the end of our session today. It is quarter past 11. Like I said before, I know I didn't get through everything. Um, it was a lot of work to get through, but your teacher will be emailed the memo so then you can um, go through it with them and get the answers. I really hope this was beneficial and I wish you all the best for your final examinations.